Welcome to the N1 Fitness Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Marcus Sadu, and today we've got Jesse Neat on the show. So Jess is actually a really good friend of mine. We've known each other since we were probably about four or five years old. We grew up in the same neighborhood, and Jesse is involved in a company called JJ Bean, which is a coffee company in Canada. They're specifically in Vancouver as well as Toronto, and Jesse is the retail operations guy. So he runs all of JJ's retail operations. And so I thought it would be cool to have him on the podcast to chat about how JJ Bean sources, grows, processes, and ultimately makes their coffee because everybody drinks it, everybody loves it. So we're going to get into all those details in this interview. So I hope you enjoy it. Jess, thanks for coming on the pod, bro. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, no worries, man. Happy to be. So how did you originally get into the coffee business to begin with? Uh, well, for me, it's the family business. So uh, my dad's dad and, and his dad, they were involved in, in coffee. Uh, my grandpa, uh, John Neat as well, um, he, he started Neat's Coffee, which is mainly a wholesale coffee business, supplying coffee to restaurants and, and cafes alike, uh, mainly restaurants at the time. And uh, we had a big, big warehouse out in, in Burnaby. And, uh, and yeah, and my dad joined up on that and was a sales manager, among other things, uh, slowly moving up the chain. And my grandpa, he, he was more about the people than he was about the coffee. So his favorite thing to do was to go out, go out for lunch, like spend time in the restaurants that he's supplying coffee to and, uh, you know, schmooze the people and, he was really a, a man of the people, and, and they loved him for that. Not to mention when, when they needed coffee or service, he was, he was prompt about it. So my dad, my dad took over a lot of that and was heavily involved, moving up, moving up the ranks there. And then uh, eventually when my, when my grandpa was done, they decided to sell. And uh, Neat's Coffee, or sorry, uh, Nestle approached them. And uh, so Net, Nestle bought out Neat's Coffee and took over wholesale customers and everything alike. After about a year working for them, uh, my dad didn't love it, didn't love working for this big corporation. So he, he went out and he purchased uh, an existing company and uh, turned it into JJ Bean back in 1996. So it started off as Vancouver's own micro roaster. We had a bunch of different, a uh, longer version of names and whatnot. And as over the years, we've just pared it down to just JJ Bean. And how many JJ shops are there now? Uh, so we have uh, we have 21 in Vancouver, although one has to close down uh, due to a demolition going on. And then we have uh, four or five in Toronto. Wow. So you guys have and get coffee from all over the world. So I'm talking like Guatemala, Kenya, Ethiopia, El Salvador, Brazil, the list goes on. So how do you guys go about sourcing your beans? First and foremost, uh, best taste wins. There's a lot of things surrounding coffee as far as, you know, the political turmoil, the farmers, et cetera, et cetera, uh, lots of stuff. And so all that stuff matters hugely to us, but ultimately best taste wins. We're not going to purchase a coffee because it's fair trade and organic and shade grown and et cetera, et cetera, if it tastes like crap, right? We buy coffee that tastes good. Then comes in ethics come into it and we want to always we're committed to paying above fair trade prices at all times um so even times when coffee doesn't cost at fair trade price sometimes it's cheaper than that uh we look at ways to give that money back to the growing region so for example we just bought a a peruvian peruvian coffee that was under fair trade value and they're not going to just take well they'll happily take more money for it But it doesn't go to the farmers necessarily. So what we did is uh, we built uh, wells in the city. So we helped provide fresh water for local residents that are the people that are actually picking at those farms and whatnot. Um, So best taste. um, And then, you know, committed to paying above fair fair trade prices. And at any time, I mean, we're not a company that talks about direct trade. We love to know the farmers and and, and the people that bring coffee to Vancouver. But... You know, there's more than just that handshake deal between you and you and the farmer. You know, there's a processor, there's a packer, there's a shipper, there's an exporter. Like, there's all these people involved that it's not, it's not, for us, it's when someone says it's direct trade, it's like, no, you're, 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 you're excluding, you know, 10 to 15 other people that are involved in getting this coffee to Vancouver. 
So that's a focus uh, for us as well, and just making sure that, that you know there's transparency down the line and in all those different aspects. And then ultimately, you know, what we think people will enjoy, which is a little bit catered to what we enjoy, and it's it's worked over these years. But we we get uh, you know every every country has coffee that. Uh, the flavors are inherent to those regions. We taste coffee from all around the world, um, and some have characteristics that a lot of people tend to like, and some have characteristics that people aren't really that stoked on. Um, so there's a bit of both in our buying practices as far as we want to get unique stuff that tastes really great, but then also we buy stuff that we know people will like. That makes sense. So I think it would be really cool for folks to know, you alluded to this, but like, what does the life of a coffee bean look like? Because much like our food, we just sort of buy beans or grounds from the store or grab an Americano at a coffee shop. So what's actually involved in growing and processing our morning coffee and then it actually getting to us here in Vancouver, specifically for JJ or Toronto, but anywhere really? Yeah, so I mean, starts with starts with uh, starts with the plant and the plant takes, you know, years of cultivating and and growing up, creating creating uh, ideal uh, soil and environment for these plants. So lots of trimming, lots of pruning, lots of things going on. And then essentially, at, once it's mature and big enough, and it yields uh, cherries. Uh, essentially, so it is a fruit. Coffee is a fruit that uh, it's a looks just like a cherry. Uh, sometimes it's yellow. Sometimes it's it's red. Mainly, those are the two colors. Orange goes from green to those colors as it ripens. A bunch of farmers or pickers go around, giant burlap sacks on these very steep, uh, often unsafe hills because uh, elevation is important with, with coffee. The higher up, the better it is. So picking these, you know, 100-pound bags of, of coffee cherries, they take these cherries down to the, down to the farmer and they weigh their cherries out. They get their money. A lot of a lot of the farmers give give pita uh, or other other type of uh, things for the family as well. Uh, that that cherry. There's then different processing methods, but the most common is a is a wash process, which happens mainly around the world. Other than Africa, it's a little bit limited because of their lack of water. But it goes through this big tank where it's washed and cleaned, and then you take the cherry off off the off the bean and then there's also another layer on the bean which is, which is a slimy mucilage that uh, again is a some people keep it on for processing but mainly in a wash method you take it off and then the coffee has to be dried uh, which either it sits on on uh, flat beds or out on fields uh, or like concrete fields then uh, there's another layer on that it has to get sent to a processing to take that husk off and then it's that nice little green bean that is put in burlap sacks and shipped shipped to us. And then again, you you roast it just like you were to you know make popcorn, but there's obviously way more science to that. Uh, roast it, and then uh, to the desired roast color uh, that you like. And then we put it on a cupping table, grind it up, taste it, and then if it's good enough, we uh, we put it out in the stores. Wow! So. You mentioned that the higher the elevation, the better the coffee is. What are some of the main factors at play that dictate how a specific bean tastes? So, for example, I guess the region, variety, processing, roasting, all that good stuff. Yeah, so very very similar to wine. Lower, lower elevations tend to not, the soil is definitely not as good as the dirtier soil. It doesn't have the, the same tropical rain conditions, uh, among a lot of things. Um, but yeah, like you said, so region is, region is first and foremost. Guatemala, for example, the coffees tend to have a very kind of chocolatey, mainly a chocolatey cocoa flavor, and secondary would be kind of a fruity flavor that comes out of them. Um, so elevation, environment, and soil are, are, are some of the main factors, uh, temperature as well. And generally, when you're kind of higher up the mountain, you kind of get that those tropical, that perfect mix of not getting too cold without... Uh, get enough heat, uh, shade. So yeah, a lot of those factors play into how the coffee tastes. But essentially, yeah, it's uh, you know the terroir, which is you know from the earth, and it's that uh, that inherent flavor that the ground and the and the geography mixed with the varietal of coffee, being it is, uh, plays into the flavor there. 
And then how about like a light, medium, and dark roast? What What is the difference and, and how does the processing vary those three things? Uh, so processing uh, doesn't really change at all. Uh, the processing is the exact same. Uh, it's just, it just comes down to the roaster and, and, you know, how they want to treat these beans. So typically as you go darker, you lose that inherent flavor of the bean. So the darker you go, the less it's going to taste like, like, you know, a connoisseur would be like a lighter, a lighter roast. He'd be able to say that's from Guatemala. As it gets darker and darker, you lose the ability to recognize the terroir or the region uh, because it extracts most of the flavor and kind of takes on a roasty or malty or smoky flavor. Um, whereas a, a coffee bean in its kind of medium to medium dark, more on the lighter side of things, without going too light, is where it really shines its its inherent flavors. You go too light. Um, like before kind of medium or first crack type thing, it, it tastes kind of green or grassy or earthy and something that not very desirable. Oh, interesting. So does light have more caffeine? Does dark have more caffeine or does it vary between the type of bean? Uh, it's negligible, um, but technically a lighter roast would have more co- or caffeine. Uh, as, as it gets darker, it loses acidity flavor and a bit of that caffeine okay gotcha so does it i i've heard that the slower that the water diffuses across the coffee bean the more caffeine a cup of coffee would have is that true or is it something that's completely different does it depend on what sort of method you use whether it's like drip or french press or whatever yeah um it definitely it definitely does have i mean there's there's a whole science behind the, you know, dissolved solids and, and all that stuff that I'm, I'm not too, uh, too versed on. For me, when someone asks about caffeine and the, the content of it, I relate it to alcohol in the sense that, you know, if you have a shot of espresso on an Americano, the espresso has a lot of caffeine per its volume, uh, but you spread it out with water. So it almost ends up being like getting a, a double vodka is equivalent to having a beer, at the, at the same time, it just hits your body a little different. Um, so I find espresso, uh, it has a higher quantity, but depending on how you have it, most people add, you know, make an Americano out of it. So it almost almost gets to that same level. It's just how your body takes it in. It, it has the different effects there. But yeah, I mean, there are different brew methods that you can, you can take advantage of to gain more caffeine. But as far as like a, a shot of espresso or Americano, or a cup of drip they're kind of they're all along the same same levels um just they kind of hit you different oh interesting that makes a ton of sense so basically a shot or two of espresso would be somewhat equivalent to i don't know a smaller a medium cup of drip coffee is that yeah. what you're saying yeah. yeah okay that makes sense now cold brew is pretty popular nowadays too so what are the differences in how that's processed and made and then comes to market versus something like a regular coffee drip coffee that someone would get in a shop. So again, same, same kind of process in, in getting there. Um, it's about, you know, again, choosing and determining which bean works well for a cold brew. Uh, you know, uh, African coffees are, are one of the most exciting and, and unique, uh, varietal out there or it, contains many varietals that are quite unique Uh, a lot of fruity floral acidic coffees that uh, most of the time people wouldn't necessarily like in a cold brew let alone in in a hot coffee sometimes you know taking a sip of coffee and be like "Mm, it tastes like strawberries is not a a a thing that people are used to uh with cold brew yeah same same process just choose choose the bean what it is uh most of the time again people most of the cold brews on the market are a little bit darker in in roast color uh, but the method, the brewing method is the big, big difference. And uh, to extract all that numminess in a, in a hot coffee takes, you know, two to, two to four minutes. Whereas cold brew, usually the process takes up, up to eight to 12 hours uh, to extract all the inherent flavor and nutrients in a coffee in a cold, cold version of that. So that's, that's the biggest difference. It's a cold. So for us, we do a toddy cold brew, uh, which is a cold, steep for eight, eight to 10 hours. Um, and it takes more coffee. Uh, the ratio is much higher as well. 
so when you talk about caffeine, if you want, if you want some caffeine, cold brew is, is, is some of the highest in caffeine. That makes sense. Cause it tastes super strong. <laughs> yeah. It, I, I honestly, like I can't finish a full cup of cold brew. It's uh it's too boozy for me. Right. Right. So would that be sort of equivalent to like, it's, it's more like the espresso than it is like the drip coffee as far as volume goes when it comes to caffeine content times two. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cause yeah. So I guess the fact that it takes more beans, it takes longer to process and stuff like that. I believe cold brew is, you know, relatively speaking more expensive. Is that why? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just the, the, the time it takes, the labor it takes and, and the, the quantity of coffee for sure. Okay, cool. So mm-hmm. coffee is like wine in the sense that there's a specific way to taste it, right? You compared it to alcohol earlier. How is the tasting process technically supposed to look? Well, first, uh, black. You know, you're never going to taste how a coffee tastes with cream and sugar. And I mean, you can still taste it. It's going to taste great. But in order to actually taste any of the varietal distinction in the coffee, it needs to be black. And for us, it's just, uh, you know, we, we, we put it in these cupping bowls and, uh, and, and just take a, take a spoonful of it and try to slurp it back in, into your mouth and uh, trying to hit all of, those, all of those senses in your mouth because, you know, coffee has flavor, body, acidity, aroma. It has, it has so much, right? Yeah, that, that's what we do is just a, a spoonful and slurp it back like a cup of soup. And that, that really just excites all your senses in the mouth. And, uh, but, I mean, you can do the same thing if you're drinking a cup of coffee, just a slow sip. Just letting that air enter your mouth while you're taking a sip really spreads it around your mouth and lets you taste those flavors. Oh, interesting. So are you supposed to keep it in your mouth for a second? Or are you supposed to send it right down? How does that work? Yeah, I, pers- I personally put it on my tongue and let it kind of like envelope off my tongue and and that that's where i can get a lot of those flavors that's i mean a lot of them are are difficult to taste so it's just over over time you know you focus on you know one thing so you say body okay is it a light body um like water or is it a heavier like a like cream or something in your mouth and then you know acidity is it you know is it bright is it exciting or is it you know just kind of flat and not much going on so all these different things so usually i'm you know each time i'm i'm focusing on one or two things Uh, related to it. That's really cool. So selfish question here. I love chocolatey coffee. I think you said that Guatemala has chocolatey coffees. Is there anything that I should look for specifically in a bean uh, to get that flavor? Is that just not possible? You just like read the description on the coffee bag or something like that? Generally, uh, South, South, South and Central American coffees have that as one of their inherent flavors. So usually if you, if you go Guatemala bean, the, the best, if you see a Guatemalan bean, you probably are hitting it on the nose there. Sometimes you can get it in Brazil's, but Brazil's mainly are nutty. So they taste kind of like a, a really clean cup of Brazil coffee will taste like peanut butter, um, wow. which, which is good. Some people love that and some people don't. Colombian coffees are quite light, but sometimes do have that, that chocolatey flavor, but they also have some tropical uh, fruits coming out in there as well. So yeah, your best bet would be to go to a Guatemalan or to have a blend, um, which, is, which is focused on getting those flavors. And there's nothing wrong with a blend. I mean, like uh, what we've been talking about a lot is just single origin coffees, just choosing one, one bridal, putting it, putting it in the cup. Uh, but a lot, of, a lot of people, and us included, uh, have blends. To kind of to give to give the the people that exactly that you know and it, there's nothing wrong with that so sometimes you'll mix a Guatemalan with a with a Brazil and it, it tastes like a chocolate milkshake type thing you know it's uh, it's great and so we have a bunch of roasts that are blends that are meant to stick to a certain profile the the varietal and the bean is constantly changing because you can't because it changes with the seasons um, but we try to meet that profile at all times so our east side for example is is typically chocolatey fruity uh and that's a blend of of usually three to four different type of varietals what are some of the other typical blends that you guys use then to bring out those specific flavors if somebody really likes a chocolate or they want to emphasize the fruit or whatever other flavors that uh, folks are liking yeah so our, our i mean we got three three standards uh 
espresso JJ, which, you know, we call it espresso just because we've, we've specced it to espresso, but you can do any type of bean on any type of use. It doesn't, doesn't matter. So you can put it on a, a drip or a French press. It doesn't matter. Uh, but our, our, our JJ is typically like a, our profile is, is, is nutty, bright, a uh, little bit of caramel. Our east side, like I said, is a chocolatey, fruity profile most of the times. Uh, and then we have Railtown, which is our darkest coffee, which is big, roasty, malty, smoky. And I mean, when we first started off JJ Bean, as it's grown over the years, we used to have, you know, 28 different blends and realized, you know, we, it's not necessary to have that many coffees. Uh, so we've, we've pared it down. Uh, but then if you want to try, like I said, if you want to try like inherent distinct flavors or like a super fruity coffee, normally Africa would do that. Africa has, I mentioned before about the water, is one of the, the main processing that they do there is a natural process where you forget all that using machines to, to clean the coffee and, and take off the pulp and whatnot. They just dry it out on, uh, on sunbeds um, or concrete in the middle of a field uh, with the cherry still on. So all of that, that fruit flavor is, is just getting soaked up into the bean. If you want to taste some crazy coffees that are very tea-like or very fruit-like or acidic or all these different unique crazy things, Africa is the, the place to do that. That's really interesting. So I guess that sounds like a less labor-intensive process because they're not peeling off all those different layers that somebody in maybe South America is, right? There, so there is that, but the, the, the problem that comes with that is the weather. So if it's, if it's 10 days of beautiful sun and, and it works out all perfectly, great. But if there's days of, of not sun or rain or, or wind or anything, you know, you have, you have the environment that can definitely affect things. Dirt, a lot of things can get into your crop and change the flavor of it. And especially, yeah, the heat's not there. You have days where mold and stuff like that could occur, which, you know, oftentimes you'll be tasting a cup of coffee where us on the cupping table will be tasting a cup of coffee and one cup tastes great. But the next cup, you're like, "Ooh, what's in there?" And there's something, there's something funky about it, and uh, and that's we talk about it not being clean, clean and consistent are two things you got to look for when you're when you're purchasing because you don't want a customer to have a random cup of coffee that you know tastes like baby diaper or something like that. <laughs> Fair enough. So some people like to buy beans and grind them themselves. Some people like to buy just the ground up beans. So how long should a bag last? Like in the in the grocery store, man, it seems to last quite a while. I don't know um, how they're doing that or if that's legit, but how long should a bag of coffee beans last? Does it vary between coffee beans and then the grounds? Uh, how should folks think about that? Yeah. I mean, coffee absolutely expires. We say it should be best best used within seven, seven to 10, seven to 14 days. And if it's ground that, that diminishes even quicker, will the coffee mold or anything like that? Chances, chances not. What, what happens is it just loses uh, inherent flavors and, and its quality. Um, so as a coffee, you know, a lot of the coffee that sits on shelves, you know, it's got that generic coffee flavor um, because it's been sitting for so long. And it, it just, you know, as oxygen, oxygen ruins, you know, all, all of our food. And if we let, let it sit for too long, it, it goes bad. So yeah, the best, best way is to, if possible, grind, grind per use, grind fresh. Uh, and you know, only, only buy what you need in the week. I mean, I, I drink a lot of coffee and I, you know, I, I only buy for the days that I know I'm going to be making coffee at home and, uh, when possible grind fresh. I don't grind fresh. I should, um, but for me, it's a convenience thing. I don't have a grinder at home. I don't have much space for it. There's a lot of cheap, you know, small grinders. But to me, I, a lot of time, coffee, I, I want to wake up and just be able to make it right away. But yeah, definitely coffee. And uh, you want to keep coffee in a, you know, a regular temperature, dark, dark space, airtight container uh, to make it last the most. But, you know, fridges, freezers, any of that stuff is is no good. And you know, in, in stores, you see, see, see a lot of stuff in, in valve bags, which is great. Um, but think of it, you know, the minute you open that valve bag, all of that CO2 is leaving the bag, oxygen's coming in, and it immediately is going to expire in a couple days. So again, it doesn't go bad. It's just not as good as it could be. Okay, that makes sense. Now, I was keeping my coffee in the fridge. So you're saying don't do that. Put it in a at room temperature in a sort of like an air sealed container or something like that yeah okay and not in the freezer either 
No, there's there's always there's been myths about that all the time, but it, it doesn't keep your coffee better. I mean, if you're going to keep coffee in the freezer, your your coffee's losing. I mean, you wouldn't buy a beautiful steak, put it in the freezer, and then take it out a couple of days later just to to cook it, right? So, I mean, anytime you put anything in the freezer, it's losing some of its uniqueness. Okay, gotcha. And as far as some of these, you know, machines, coffee machines that folks use, how should they? think about going about like some people just use like a regular plastic whatever turn it on put the filter in the top and pour the coffee uh the coffee grounds on top of that or they have some sort of fancy espresso machine so like how should folks think about what kind of machine they might want to use or not and then what flavors might come out of that or the benefits of the or the cons i find that at home drip machines uh they don't get the water hot enough uh, so you're not extracting a lot of those inherent flavors and qualities, and it's not scientific. I don't have the backing behind it, but I don't think you're also extracting a lot of that nutrients in the coffee as well. You're missing out on it um, because the coffee needs to get to a certain heat to extract that. So I find when you're tasting a cup from one of those, it's it's no good. One of the more intensive for, for a person would be a pour over cone where you just use hot water, have a little cone on top of a cup and pour it over. And that's great if you like that style of of coffee. For me, the simplest is a French press. I'm trying to avoid all type of, you know, plastics or any type of materials that that would taint the flavor of the coffee at all. You know, depending on the, the quality of the plastic that you use, you know, sometimes it, you know, starts to soften up, which if it softens, chances are you're getting a bit of that plasticky flavor in there as well. Um, so for me, yeah, the simplest is, is a French press. You know, I have a either mark it on the inside or use scoops, whatever it be. And I find a French press, what you taste it in a store, you'll be able to taste at home in a French press. The easiest, uh, you know, there's a lot of brew guides online. You know, it's usually you put your coffee in, put water in for four minutes, break the crust, put the plunger down, and, and you're pretty much good to go. Uh, the coffee's a little bit silty, silty sometimes, but aside from that, it makes a great cup at home, camping, um, et cetera. Uh, but the other, the other methods, yeah, would be a pour over cone, which is, is quite successful. But using a hot water kettle is, is key to get that te- uh, the water temperature up. Other, you know, people have ha- at-home espresso machines. But again, the, unless you're spending big bucks, like 1000 plus, uh, you're not getting enough pressure to extract that coffee out. So unless you're getting a plumbed-in espresso machine that's going to cost you two to four grand, go to the store. Go to your local JJ. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, for me, yeah, the easiest at-home. Uh, another one that I'm not too familiar with, but a lot of people use, is called an AeroPress. It's, again, a very quite simple method. Uh, those three would be the, the easiest, simplest, and bring the most clarity and quality in the cup, I think. Okay, and for the folks who would want to know, what do you use a specific type of French press? Like, is there a certain brand that you like or a number of brands? Um, we've been pretty loyal and committed to just Bodum brand. Um, I think they make good quality stuff, and they their all their products are quite you know, warranty proof and whatnot. That being said, I've bought, I bought random glass, uh, Mr. Coffee, uh, French presses when I've, you know, at London drug is, it, it was 10 bucks. It's made out of glass though. And that's all that really matters. As long as you're not getting super dirty cups when you're pouring for me, yeah, the bigger thing would just be avoid plastic. If you can glass, glass or stainless is, is going to taste better and retain the heat better. Okay. And what do you mean by dirty cups? Uh, just like, especially French press, uh, because it doesn't have a filter other than a, a stainless steel mesh, uh, filter in, in the actual apparatus. Uh, so a lot of the time you'll have a cup that, that has like a, a sludge at the bottom of it, which a lot of people will find unpleasant. A lot of people don't care. They're like, whatever, but usually just at the end of the cup. Uh, whereas anything that goes through a, a paper filter is going to be a lot cleaner, uh, because of that. But what I've found is sometimes being too clean, you miss out on some of those cool flavors that the coffees have. So it seems like JJ is, you know, expanding like crazy as usual. What do you guys have on the go right now? We just opened a new uh, cafe in, uh, in Kits on uh, Broadway and uh, McKenzie. We're excited about that because we've been looking at the, the Kits area for a long time and haven't been able to find anything. And another neighborhood that we've been looking for and uh, excited to be joining pretty soon is uh, Hastings and Madison up in uh, Burnaby Heights there. So we have those two going on. But you know, for us, for us as we grow, the big big thing is 
is how do we grow but maintain who we are, ma- make sure that quality is, is not going down but going up, and we have you know consistency uh, around all of our stores. So a big thing coming up for us is we have a, a vision retreat for some of the leaders uh, in two weeks here, and we're going to talk kind of kind of some of our you know small picture and big picture plans of how we can continue making JJ uh, what it is and, and great and and yeah. So those two shops are in Vancouver. How about Toronto? Are you guys tapped out on Toronto right now? Toronto, we're holding off on right now. We have we have a roastery and and cafes out there that uh, you know those are self sustainable as it is, and uh, we're always open to opportunities as they come. Um, but our we we never grow just for the purpose of growing. Um, if uh, you know we have some amazing staff, and our and our key for growth is creating opportunities for them. Um, so if, if, if we have everyone that's like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm set, I'm solid. I don't want to do anything else. That's fine with us. We don't need to do anything else. But if we have people say, Hey, give me more, like, what, what can I do to move up in this company? What can I do? Then we're looking for opportunities. I mean, we have, we have hundreds, not hundreds. We have lots of opportunities that, that, that come into us all the time say, Hey, JJ, or we'd love to have a JJ in this office. or we'd love to have a JJ over in Coquitlam or in Richmond. And, you know, or Victoria or Whistler. There's a lot of, a lot of people that come to us with great opportunities. It's just a matter of what, you know, what, what's the purpose of us doing this? Is it going to be a benefit to, to the, the neighborhood that we're joining and to our, to our people? Um, you know, we don't want to create an opportunity that, you know, Hey, we're opening up a shop in Alberta and be like, Hey, we're shipping someone there. And you know, that's, that's not what we want to do just, just for the profit. Obviously we want to choose places that are profitable in order to continue growing but we've got to make sure we're doing it for the right reasons. That makes a ton of sense, man. Now I'm pretty sure you deleted all your social media stuff a while back. So if folks want to learn more about you, they can't really, but how can they learn more about JJ and what you guys are up to? Uh, yeah. So we have, you know, JJ Bean has all of its social media accounts and, and websites and, and there's, you know, there's tons of coffee related Instagrams and, and people out there, but yeah, you, I mean, you can check out our website, you can check out our Instagram I'd be remiss to, I don't, I'm not really even sure what it is. I assume it's, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, just type in JJ Bean Coffee and you'll find it. We have one of our, our coffee quality guys on there often. His name's Grady Bueller and he's, uh, he's our coffee sommelier. Uh, he's, he's what's called a Q grader, which is a, a very highly qualified coffee, coffee taster. Um, you know, he went through many tests where you can, you have to determine which is higher in acid, this one or this one or this one, like all these crazy tests that he went through to be qualified for it. So there's very few people that are qualified as a Q grader. And so he's our, he's our ultimate coffee, coffee quality guy here and, uh, and helps with the roasting process as well. But he's often on there, you know, talking about our, our new, our new coffees that are coming out and explaining them to people and talking about them. But the big thing, if you're interested in coffee is just continue tasting it, you know, go to, and, and the biggest thing, like I said earlier is try to do it black. And, uh, if you can, if you can slowly taste coffee black, you'll realize pretty quickly what's good coffee and bad coffee. And, uh, for, that's, that's the, the start of the journey. I mean, you can read up lots and try to burst yourself on it. Um, but essentially, you know, try to, try to taste coffee lots. And, uh, we have one of the things that our staff have to do to get a raise is, is be able to cup coffee blindly and say, to, and just talk about it and talk about it correctly. And they always ask like, what do I do to prepare? What do I do to prepare? Stop drinking lattes, stop drinking, you know, everything in between, just, just drink drip coffee or, or French press and uh, really just sit there and focus on it. Um, same thing with beer or wine. If you want to get good at it, you got to just keep drinking it. Okay, man. Well, I'll link to all that stuff in the show notes. And thanks, uh, thanks again for taking the time. That was awesome. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, man. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview with Jesse Neat around growing, sourcing, processing, and making your coffee on a daily basis. I thought it was really interesting to find out what that process actually looks like as far as, you know, we just see the coffee beans in the store kind of thing, or we pick up a coffee from the shop, but it was cool to see what actually goes into that process behind the scenes. I hope you enjoyed that. Now, if you're interested in personalized one-on-one nutritional coaching or workout programming with me, you can click the link in the show notes below titled nutritional coaching or workout programming. You can also follow me on Instagram at n1fitness or feel free to friend me up on Facebook at Marcus Sadu. 
That's it for today, guys. I will catch you on the next episode. See ya.